Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about leg and ankle functional anatomy. Uh, now, as a reminder, anatomically, the leg is the area between the knee and the ankle. So that is specifically what I'm talking about here. So from uh, the inferior side of the knee joint, um, and then also including the ankle. So the ankle complex, uh, includes three articulations, uh, subtalar joint, the telocoral joint, and the distal tibiofibular joint. Uh, the foot is made up of many joints, so we're not going to get into all the joints of the foot today, um, but there are many, many joints that compose the foot, just like we saw with the wrist and hand. Um, isolation of movement in a single joint of the ankle is not possible. So we try <laughs> when I demonstrate actions and things like that. And when we analyze uh, movements, we try to isolate movement and to describe movement um, as best we can. Uh, but in reality, um, as much as we try to isolate, it really isn't possible for only one joint to actually move at a time. Uh, so starting with the subtalar joint, also referred to as the talocalcaneal joint, uh, it's the articulation between talus and calcaneus. Um, so we describe its movement as inversion and eversion, uh, but that is actually very simplified. Um, we, we describe it as inversion and eversion happening in the frontal plane around the anterior posterior axis. But that it's actually a lot more complicated than that. It's a bicondylar joint and its action actually occurs in sort of an oblique plane, but it's oblique in one direction and then in a different oblique plane in the other direction. Um, so to simplify, we sort of average the two oblique planes and call it the frontal plane, um, but it's, it's a bit more complicated than that. Um, and then also inversion and eversion is a component of ankle pronation and supination, which are actions of the whole ankle complex together. Um, no muscles attached to talus. That is a very interesting fact about talus. It is one of only two bones in the body where that's the case. The other is in the ear. Um, so no muscles attached to talus, which means that its stability and its function is 100% dependent on all of the inert structures that hold it in place. So the inert structures of both the subtalar and the talocrural joints, so the joint capsules, the ligaments, um, the bursas, the cartilage, et cetera, um, all have to hold this joint in place um, because, or both joints in place to hold the bone in place because there are no muscles, there's no contractile force um, that is able to contribute to the stability of talus. The talocrural joint is the articulation between talus and the bones of the crural region, hence its name. The crural region being the region between the knee and the ankle, so the bones of the crural region are the tibia and fibula. Okay, the distal tibiofibular joint is the articulation between the tibia and fibula at the distal end of the bones. Uh, so the distal tibiofibular joint is a uh, syndesmotic joint. It's a fibrous joint, so it's joined together by ligaments. Um, and of course, the, the tibia and fibula are joined together by an interosseous membrane, just like we have at the radius and ulna. Um, so that it allows a slight amount of gliding and rotation to accommodate the movement at the ankle and at the knee, um, but it's amphiarthrotic. It is not diarthrotic because it's not a synovial joint. So the proximal tibiofibular joint is synovial and is inside of the knee capsule shared by the whole, uh, or inside of the joint capsule shared by the whole knee complex. Um, the distal tibiofibular joint is a syndesmotic joint. It is not synovial. So it is not freely movable. It just offers a little bit of movement and is amphiarthrotic. Okay, pronation and supination. Uh, so in this picture, this is the right foot in all three examples here. So it's showing you the angulation of the whole ankle, essentially, um, during pronation, uh, neutral position, and supination. So pronation is a combination of talocoral dorsiflexion, forefoot abduction, and subtalar uh, eversion. You combine all of those things together, and what you get is pronation. 
Supination is a combination of the exact opposite. So tallow curl plantar flexion, forefoot adduction, and subtalar inversion. Um, now to clarify, pronation and supination are normal functions of the ankle complex that happen alternately during gait. Um, so that's normal and our ankles need to be able to have these functions. Um, it's only when these, when pronation or supination become extreme, so it's hyperpronation and hypersupination that that becomes a problem. Um, and we can observe this by, as we see in the picture here, we can look at the calcaneal tendon and in a neutral position, the calcaneal tendon should be vertical. It should be pretty straight. Um, and then we can see that angulation in either direction as pronation or supination occurs. And that angle, of course, will be more extreme, the more extreme the pronation or supination is. Okay, regions of the foot. Uh, the rear foot is the posterior portion made up of only the calcaneus and talus. Uh, the midfoot is anterior to that. Um, that includes the remaining tarsals. So we do have seven tarsals. Talus and calcaneus are the first two. So the other five are what are making up the midfoot. Um, this area acts as a shock absorber when the foot makes contact with the ground. And then we have the forefoot and toes. That's our third region. Um, it's the most anterior and it includes the five metatarsals and 14 phalanges on each foot. The bones of the feet make up three arches. So these arches increase the flexibility of the foot and serve as shock absorbers. So we're gonna go through each arch. So the medial longitudinal arch is what we usually are talking about when you talk about the arch of the foot. So it's on the medial side going the long axis of the foot. Um, so it includes calcaneus, talus, navicular, medial cuneiform, and the first metatarsal. So four of our tarsals plus the first metatarsal form the medial longitudinal arch. The plantar fascia supports the medial and lateral longitudinal arches the same way that a bow string gives uh, a bow a curve. So if we look in the picture here, we can see that very clearly. Um, the plantar fascia, we're talking about the, the sheet of fascia on the plantar surface of the foot, the bottom of the foot. And what you can see in the picture here is how it's attaching to calcaneus and then it's pulled taut across the bottom of the foot and attaches then to the forefoot. Um, so it's acting like the string on, um, on a bow where it's causing the, the bow, or in this case, the foot to sort of arch. Okay, so the plantar fascia is there to support those two arches. Okay, the lateral longitudinal arch is what we see in the bottom picture here. In the top, we're seeing the medial arch, in the bottom, we're seeing the lateral arch. Uh, it's formed by calcaneus, cuboid, and the fifth metatarsal. Uh, it's lower and more rigid than the medial longitudinal arch, but there is still an arch there. The transverse metatarsal arch is going across the ball of the foot. Uh, so the lengths of the metatarsals and tarsals with the first and fifth metatarsal heads primarily bearing the weight. Okay, so there's an arch in the ball of the foot, and we're primarily bearing weight on the medial and lateral part of that arch, so the first and fifth metatarsal heads, um, supported through a buttress formed by the other two arches. So if we have dysfunction in one of the other two arches, that is going to affect the function of the transverse metatarsal arch because it is formed with support by the other two arches. As you see in the picture here, those other two arches come forward and end at either end of the transverse arch. Okay, compartments of the leg. Uh, so the leg, again, between the knee and the ankle um, is divided into compartments by fascial linings. So we have four compartments of the leg. We have the anterior, lateral, and then two posterior compartments, superficial posterior and deep posterior compartments. Each is encased by fascial linings, which prevent interstitial fluid from passing between compartments. 
Okay, and this is true in lots of places in the body. We have compartments um, in our upper limbs. We have compartments everywhere um, where we have fascial linings that are dividing between muscles and, and structures. Um, I bring them up here and I haven't mentioned them elsewhere because um, this will be important when we talk about injuries and, and dysfunctions in the leg. We're gonna talk about compartment syndrome. Uh, but I just want to point out that this is present in other places and there also can be um, compartment related injuries in other extremities also. Uh, so the anterior compartment uh, is in this picture, it's the yellow portion on the anterior part of the leg. And that's where we have the dorsiflexor muscles. Uh, tibialis anterior is the most superficial and provides 80% of the force during dorsiflexion. So it is by far the agonist during dorsiflexion. So 80% of the force. So tibialis anterior is in this compartment along with extensor hallucis longus, extensor digitorum longus, and peroneus tertius, all located in this anterior compartment. Uh, the lateral compartment in the picture is that green space and it has the everters, which is really only the peroneals. Uh, so peroneus longus is the most superficial in this compartment and peroneus brevis is deep to peroneus longus. Uh, so that's what we're seeing in the picture on the right there. There's peroneus longus and if we pull that away, we would see peroneus brevis just deep to that. Uh, so these two muscles are all that is located in that lateral compartment. In the superficial posterior compartment, we have our superficial plantar flexors. Okay, so it includes the plantar flexor muscles that all insert together into the calcaneus via the calcaneal tendon. So that is three muscles. That's gastrocnemius, soleus, and plantaris. I don't believe we covered plantaris in this class, uh, but if you look in this bottom um, picture here, you can see plantaris. If you look right behind the knee, there's this teeny little muscle belly, and then it has this long tendon that goes all the way down. That is plantaris. Okay, so it's sort of sandwiched between soleus and gastrocnemius. Uh, and is biarticular, so it does cross the knee and the ankle. So all three of those muscles are in the posterior, superficial posterior compartment, and then they all insert together as they come together as the calcaneal tendon. Uh, gastrocnemius and soleus together form the tricep surrey muscle group. Uh, gastrocnemius is active in plantar flexion when the knee is extended, of course, because of active insufficiency. Uh, if the knee is flexed, then um, it isn't able to shorten to a great enough extent to transfer force uh, to the calcaneus to actually cause plantar flexion. Uh, soleus is a postural muscle and active in plantar flexion when the knee is flexed. So with a flexed knee, soleus would be the agonist in plantar flexion. With the knee extended, gastrocnemius would be the agonist in plantar flexion because it is larger and stronger. And with the knee extended, it would be an, at an advantage as a biarticular muscle compared to soleus. Plantaris is a small biarticular muscle also located in this compartment that we pointed out here. Then we have the deep posterior compartment. So this is the compartment deep to soleus. Um, so underneath that we have on uh, this picture, you can see it's the red compartment there, uh, contains the deep plantar flexor muscles, including tibialis posterior, flexor digitorum longus and flexor hallucis longus. Um, tibialis posterior is the only one in this compartment that has no action on the digits. So all of the others in the deep posterior compartment go all the way out to the digits on uh, the plantar surface of the foot. Uh, it's a primary adductor of the forefoot. Okay, so it turns the foot in to adduct the forefoot and it controls pronation. So it is very active during running. So as I mentioned before, there's a lot of pronation normally occurs during gait. That's a normal healthy part of gait. Um, during running, so when we increase our speeds, there's even more pronation. Um, that means that um, tibialis posterior is going to be very active during running because it's controlling pronation. It's helping to prevent hyperpronation. 
Um, so injury or weakness to tibialis posterior would cause hyperpronation during running because it wouldn't be able to control pronation adequately. And then as I mentioned, flexor digitorum longus and flexor hellesis longus are also located in this deep posterior compartment. Okay, that is it for this lecture and I'll see you for the next one.